Tickets. Tickets, please. Step inside. Take a ride upon the terror train. All aboard, be fair warned. These rails house fear and pain. Find a seat. Don't mind the heat. Just pray the lights stay on. Upon these rails, these bloody rails, in darkness lies no dawn. Yes, step inside. Come crawl or glide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Take it, please. <laughs> James Ward Kirk Publications presents Terror Train Episode 108 Indiana Devil's Chariot by Dennis Banning. Along the countryside, the ghost train rumbles along its steel path, thundering unyieldingly through eternity. The Devil's Iron Chariot 
Fueled by coal-fed steeds, drags linked cars, coupled like a chain forged in hell's furnace. Passengers imprisoned in cattle boxes, dying slowly as blood trickles down the windows. Forming puddles where hellhounds lap greedily with forked tongues. The stench of decay burns living nostrils. Hot tears carve out channels in their tortured faces, wetting numb, trembling lips. The last grasp of sanity drains from their deluded minds that once believed in fairy tales. Now they are left with only the sound of their own piercing cries, like the wail of the devil's train whistle, an inescapable nightmare. Summer Train by Bridget Kephart <coughs> The punch came out of nowhere, smashing against Colby's arm and nearly knocking him off the log where he sat, the blow accompanied by the taunting chant. Pinch, poke, owe me a coke. Ow, douchebag, Colby said. He rolled up the sleeve of his Macklemore t-shirt to reveal a fist-sized spot reddening on his skin. Punch me again and I'll owe you a fat lip, Colby said as he rose to his feet. He poked a finger into Max's chest, jabbing the line of Max's t-shirt, which read, I brought awesome. What did you bring? Hey, I saw them first, Max said, dancing off to the left and out of Colby's reach. No need to get testes. Max had the bulk of a small bull. He played football for their school, and Colby honestly didn't think Max realized his own strength. Colby followed the line of Max's finger to where it pointed up the hill at two figures. One was Sarah, a blonde girl in a raspberry tank top and jean shorts, who carried a navy blue backpack slung casually over one shoulder. Accompanying her was Darius, the youngest of the group. He wore jeans and a long-sleeved striped shirt with his own backpack slung over a shoulder. His clothing looked out of place for summer. 
but was typical for Darius. Rolling clouds in the dark sky crept closer to their stretch of the woods. About time, Colby called. We need to catch the train before the rain starts. It's my fault, said Darius, pushing his glasses up to his nose. Mom decided today was the day I needed to go over the accelerated learning classes that the school thinks I should be enrolled in. She woke me up at six and didn't leave for the clinic until almost nine. They exchanged hand slaps, fist bumps, and finger flicks before they all turned as one and headed toward the tracks. We already missed the hot air balloons at the fair opening, Colby said, looking down at his watch. But we might be able to hit the midway before it rains out. They heard a low, forlorn call not a minute later. Looking at each other, they took off at a run. The horn always sounded as it slowed through town, which meant that they had about seven minutes before the train rolled through the meadow that they were currently crossing. They'd have to get across the track so they could hide before the engine car rolled past. It was the only way to get on the boxcars without discovery by a conductor. There was barely enough time to crouch down and hide before the first of the cars started its slow, lumbering pass. There had been rare occasions when they'd shared their car with the hobo, but had they known what the boxcars were carrying that day, there would have been a unanimous vote to skip the Vigo County Fair. Sarah was the first to feel the drops of rain hit her cheek as they patiently waited for the section of the train where the open boxcars began. She raised her hand to her face and wiped. It's already starting to rain. At least we'll be on the train if it starts to pour, Max said. Then he stood and took off at a trot toward the passing train. Colby sprinted past him, paced the train for a minute, then grabbed the handle on the side of the door and pulled himself up into the open doorway. Sarah was right behind him. He tugged her by the arm, dragging her in and out of the way just as Darius reached the opening. Darius was a little guy, but the way he handled himself made up for it. He and Max played on the same football team. He could run fast, jump high, and kick like a mule. Which is why he was not only the kicker for the team, but also their best running back. Ironically, he didn't really like sports much. He was prodding from his dad that kept him on the team. He would have preferred the company of a good book than the rampart smells of body odor that emanated from the junior high locker room. He jogged aside the opening, feeling his heart speed up as he lunged for the door. The ground was barely wet, but he felt his feet slip, and then he slid sideways as large chunks of white limestone rushed toward his face. With a startled cry, his hands flew out in front of him. A rush of air pushed past him, then seemed to tug him downwards as the train swept indifferently along its metal highway. He felt the jolt as his backpack snagged, and he flew up and through the air, sailing past Colby to sprawl in the middle of the boxcar. Max flung himself through the opening a second later. Oh shit, Darius said. Oh shit, dude, I almost died. I saw my whole life flash before my eyes. You almost made me fall, asswipe, Max said, brushing himself off. You're eleven. How much life could you see rushing past your eyes, Colby said, rolling his eyes toward Sarah. She laughed, shook her head, and moved to the front of the boxcar, where she swung her backpack around and dug through its contents. You saved my life, Darius said. Whatever, Max said as he dropped to his knees next to Sarah. Did you bring us lunch? Dad was a boy scout. He taught me to always be prepared, she said, pulling an apple from the pack and tossing it to Max. Well, good, because I'm hungry. He caught the apple in his hand and frowned. Don't you have anything good? In some cultures, if you save a life, you're responsible for that person for the rest of their life, Darius said. 
In your dreams, running man. In your dreams, Max said as he tossed the apple back to Sarah. What about a candy bar or a sandwich? I'll take a steak or some fried chicken. I'm not picky. He already ate at my house. He eats like a friggin' horse, Colby said, sliding down the wall of the boxcar to land between Sarah and Darius. Hey, I'm a growing boy. Max patted his belly, then for good measure patted his ass. He was solid. Sarah smothered a laugh and tossed him a Milky Way, and then retrieved the sandwiches she had tucked into the bag. We got egg salad, turkey, bologna, tuna, and there's a plain cheese, and... She tossed the last one to Darius, who caught it and grinned. Peanut butter and jelly for the brainiac over there. They dug into their small feast as the train rhythmically thudded down the tracks. It was loud, and yet silent for the most part. On occasion, someone would let a joke fall between them. Otherwise, the hum of the train put them into a semi-conscious lull. Outside, the sky had grown dark as night and the wind blew through the door in gusts, blowing drops of rain into the open doorway. The four crept closer together as the storm raged until they were sitting in a small, tight circle next to the front wall of the boxcar. A blinding flash of light caused them all to jump, and followed by a low-barreled roar as thunder rolled across the train. Did anybody notice what this train is carrying? Darius said, looking off toward the back of the boxcar. In truth, nobody had. They looked now. There were rows of long boxes stacked three high. On the end of each box was a large tattoo print. Batesville Coffin Company. Since 1884. The boxes looked weathered, old, and used like they had been dug out of the ground sometime in the not-so-distant past. Huh. I wonder if those are from the graves they dug out of the Sandusky place. The paper had a big write-up about how they were going to move the old cemetery. Some controversy about it not being legal to move the bodies without family approval or something, Colby said. Suddenly, Max rolled onto his back with a groan, lifted his right leg up to his chest, and a vibrato rumble erupted from his backside. Sarah squealed, and scooted crab style away from Max, while Colby kicked him in the leg. Darius didn't move. He just sat and stared at the boxes in the back of the car. Rude, 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 Sarah said. A man's gotta do what a man's gotta do, he said. Hey, Cole, do farts have lumps? In answer, Colby gave him another kick to the leg. There was another flicker of light, followed by a boom. Colby looked at his watch. The train was moving slowly due to the storm. They probably still had 20 minutes before they hit the city limits where the Vigo County Fair was being held. The day was shot with all the rain. Still, he'd prefer to get off this train as soon as possible. Do you smell that? Darius said. Max's fart? Sarah asked and then broke into a fit of giggles. No. Darius shook his head, then tilted it as if listening. I noticed it before. I think it's coming from back there. Smell like dirt? Dead bodies? Max asked. Oh, de poo? Smells like something died, yeah. So, let's go look, Max said, rolling to his feet. He pointed at Colby. You go first, fearless leader. Sarah fished a flashlight out of her backpack. Then, she rolled to her knees, used the back wall for leverage, and hauled herself to a sitting position. I'll go first. I got the light. She's got bigger balls than you, my friend, Max said to Colby. Those are his balls, Darius said. There was a round of snickers. We could get off this car and pick another. This train's going slow enough, 
Darius suggested. Where is your sense of adventure? Max said. He pushed Sarah ahead of him, as if guiding her. I left it in my other shorts. You know, the clean pair I'm going to need if we find anything gross back here. They moved slowly. The motion of the train made it a bit like walking on a boat on the sea. Kind of rolling on occasion, even though the speed was relatively slow. Sarah didn't want to touch it, but her hand brushed the coffin box. She used it to steady herself as she made her way down the center aisle between the caskets. There were twelve boxes, all marked Batesville Coffin Company, all looking freshly removed from the ground. There should be more of these, Colby said quietly. I think I read there were twenty to fifty graves being moved. They weren't sure, because some were so old the markers had been worn away to nothing. When did you start reading, Einstein? Max asked quietly. Sometimes my parents make me sit with them at breakfast and read the paper. It's a lost art. You wouldn't understand. Shh! Do you hear that? Sarah asked. Hear what? Darius asked. The lightning was so bright and blinding. They jumped as if puppets connected by the same string, then pushed close together in a huddle as the sound of thunder rippled through the boxcar, echoing off its sides and shaking the entire train on its tracks. Geez, I think that hit the train. You can smell it now, though, right? Darius asked. I smell something, Sarah said, inching forward. I think I shit my pants. That might be what you smell, Max said. Really, Max? Why don't you relax with the jokes for a minute, man? Toby said, feeling the tension in his shoulders. His nerves were standing on end from the last blast of lightning, and it felt like he had strings of wire laced throughout his body, getting ready to explode at any moment. Another lightning strike might set his body aflame. Another joke from Max and he might explode in a different manner. One thing was certain. He didn't want Sarah in the front with the light. He moved forward and reached out to remove it from her hand. I got it, she said, and stepped further into the darkness. She swept the beam across the floor and up the boxes. At the end of the aisle was another gap before the back wall of the boxcar. She swept the beam across the walls over the ceiling, brought it down and crossed the floor. The smell was stronger. The light beam passed a discolored lump in the back corner as she drew the light back across it. She stabbed the beam toward it, then made a circle, bringing the other's attention to it. What is it? Darius asked. She shrugged. Can't tell from here. Might not be what smells either. So, get closer, Max said. She handed him the light and stepped back. You get closer. I think I see something moving over there. What do you mean, something moving? She shrugged and turned her wide blue eyes toward Colby and said, Like a shadow or something. Darius pushed forward, one finger positioned on the bridge of his glasses, as if bringing the lenses closer to his face would give him a better look at what was just beyond the circle of light. His brown eyes showed too much of the white of his eyes and looked comical in the darkness of the boxcar. Max shined a flashlight up under Darius's chin and everyone broke out into a fit of giggles. It wasn't a fun fit of giggles, the kind that come out of something really funny being said or done, and worked its way into the body, becoming irresistible. It wasn't that kind of giggle at all. It was the kind of giggle that comes from embarrassment, fear, uncertainty. The kind that masks something else resting just below the surface, as if to do anything other than giggle at the uncertainty would cause something too horrible to be named to become real. So, we giggle and pretend this isn't really so bad. It 
was that kind of giggle. It was just enough to snap the fragile hold Colby had on his self-control. He snatched the light from Max and stomped toward the dark mass in the corner. It was moving. The remains of a carcass abuzz with flies, its fur moving with a death pulse under its skin. Colby held his nose and put the light closer. I think it's a cat, he said. Max came forward then, sleeve up over his nose. He crouched next to the carcass and poked at it with a piece of wood he found lying on the floor. The fly surrounding the body rose like a thick cloud that seemed to grow and expand, then thin and ghostly for a moment, finally drifting back to the remains like a wave rolling back into the ocean. Quit that! What's wrong with you? Colby said, nudging Max away from the body. Max rocked back on his heels, one hand splayed to stop him from landing on his butt. His hand landed in a sticky substance. From the muttered, gross, that escaped his lips, to the putrid waft of stench that rose from the puddle, Max felt his stomach muscles clench and respond without his will. He heaved, spilling chicken salad amid the swirls of Milky Way in a heavy stream of mucus. Colby jumped back. Jesus, Max! Darius and Sarah had come close and now jumped back as well. Max huddled in the single beam of light spilling from the flashlight. His body shook again and they heard a splash as newly expunged food joined the other pile on the floor. He held one hand out, the one he had stuck in the goo, and struggled to his feet. Something dropped from his hand, disappearing back into the darkness on the floor. God, please tell me you have a handy wipe, bleach, a towel, anything in your backpack, Max said, holding his goo-covered hand out. Flipping open her cell phone, Sarah used its light and disappeared between the boxes. She returned a moment later, carrying a small hand towel and a bottle of water, her backpack repositioned over her shoulder, in case they needed it again. This is the best I can do, she said, handing over the items. A new smell joined the smell of death, a marriage of sweet pre-digested food, stomach bile, dirt and mold, and another putrid, unidentifiable scent. If pushed, Colby might have thought of it as liquefied and rotting guts. Max poured the water over his hand, stomach still heaving into a wretch, but not climaxing to actual vomit. He poured and wiped, and poured and wiped, water dripping to the floor and adding to the already nasty thickness coating the floor of the boxcar. Then, Max tossed the small hand towel down to the corner as well, adding to the pile of trash. You don't want that towel back, believe me. Darius held his nose, standing at the edge of the light. Another burst of light flashed through the car and backlit him, a dark shadow in the light, looking like a negative in a life-size shot from a camera. I'm getting out of here, Max said. Out of here where? Colby said. Off this train. Something's not right here, Max said. What's with that stuff? Sarah said. Cat guts? Max suggested. I've lost my appetite for the fare. Here, let me have the light, Darius said, gently removing the flashlight from Colby's hand. He held his nose and moved closer to the cat. He gagged, gave a single dry heave, and clamped down on his mouth, but didn't retreat. He moved the beam across the dead cat to the vomit, and then to the goo with the handprint in it. Logic told him the pool of slime came from the body of the critter lying at his feet. He allowed the beam of light to trace the outline of the pool and the puddle. The slick was leading away from the animal. He trailed the beam across the floor, following the slickness, as it traced into the darkness toward the end of one coffin box 
where a thick trail of wetness seemed to be oozing from the crate. Aw, oh, dear, why did you have to do that? It made me puke just thinking it was cat guts. Are you telling me one of those dead bodies is leaking? I'm not saying anything. You don't have to be Sherlock to figure out the goo is oozing out of this box, though. Shouldn't there be an embalming smell to this? Sarah asked. Not necessarily, Darius said, moving away and handing the flashlight back to Colby. Smell that sweet scent, almost like flowers? It's probably lavender. It combines with turpentine as the preservative, lavender to help hide any odors. Then again, not everybody was wealthy enough for formal embalmment. They'd be lucky if they got a box to go into the ground. Why do you even know this stuff? Colby asked. I am the son of two African-American doctors and a family who has had few college graduates. It's not like I get a choice. Some of the knowledge is absorbed through osmosis. Yeah, well, I've had enough creepy shit for one day. Max made a move to shuffle past them. You guys go on without me. I'll walk back along the tracks once the train has passed. You can't go out there in this storm. Sarah grabbed his arm. Max fixed on a dark smudge against the left side of her nose for a moment, wondering where she had picked up the mark. The boxcar was filthy. She could have gotten it anywhere. He reached out and touched her nose, giving it a wipe. The jokes were always about Sarah and Colby being a couple, but they really weren't. And secretly, Max had the bigger crush on her. For a moment, he forgot that he wanted to get off the train. If Sarah wanted to stay, then he'd stay. She was right. It was raining, after all. He'd be an idiot to get off the train. You've got something on your face, he said. Sarah smiled. A series of flashes illuminated the car, flickering fast, catching each of them in the process of some movement like a cartoon strip or still shots from a movie reel. They were slow dancers caught in the color spray of a disco ball. The thunder was one continuous rumble, shaking the air around them as time seemed to pass slowly. Five seconds, ten seconds, fifteen seconds, and then silence, followed by plink, plink, Plink. They looked toward the roof. It sounded as if the car had sprung a leak. They listened as the rhythmic plink, plink, plink continued. Then the pattern changed. Plink, plink, plink. Pause. Plink, plink, plink like a single finger tapping out a rhythm. That's just weird, Max finally said. The rain had stopped. Colby didn't know what Max thought was weird, the sound coming to them, or that the storm seemed to have stopped. There was a greenish glow all around them, coming from the sky outside and moving through the boxcar, permeating the air as the temperature dropped rapidly and took on an eerie calm. Too cold for a midsummer day. Too quiet for the space after such a violent storm. Too dark for an early July morning. A long, low, barely audible squeak, sounding a bit like a whistle, broke the silence. Darius whispered, I think there are evil spirits living in Max's butt. Sarah giggled. Max held up a hand. That didn't come from me. Colby swept the light beam across the floor, at their feet, then up the sides of the box that had been leaking the foul-smelling gunk. There was a scratching, followed by a whispered groan. The lid appeared to slide and shift, dancing within the shadows, and accompanied by the rusty creak of the boxcar doors beginning to slide shut.
they began to run. First in a clumsy, three stooges shuffle, bumping into each other, and then straightening out to make a direct line toward the slow closing door. No one had noticed. The train had stopped. Darius flew out the door first, startling the conductor who had come down the line and was now in the process of closing the boxcar door. He was followed in quick succession by Max, who hit the ground and stumbled, Sarah, who almost tumbled over him, and then Colby, who flew over both, went down to his knees, then quickly resumed his footing. They took off for the tree line along the tracks like a flock of geese being chased by rabbit dogs and didn't stop running until they were several yards into the woods. The rain started up again. In the distance, they heard the low moan of the train whistle, and the rusty sound of steel against steel as the wheels of the train began to move on down the tracks. They had spent their summer jumping trains into town. This one was the last train they'd ride that year. Yes, our guests have taken their permanent seats from New York to time and infinity. Are you ready to join them? Hmm. Perhaps another story will lure you. Choose a car, any car. For the time we had a permanent guest. As they tell their tales of horror at its best. Come. Survived this trek? No turning back. Dare resist, just try. Step back inside, we'll be your guide. So many ways to die. Upon this ride, nowhere to hide. With us, you shall remain. Upon this ride, this hellish ride, we call the Terror Train. Terror Train Podcast, Episode 108, Indiana. Produced by Krista Clark Rabowski, David Schutz II, and Mary Genevieve Fortier. Podcast directed and arranged by David Schutz II. The conductor, or narrator, was created by and played by David Schutz II. Terror, the disembodied voice, was created by and played by Mary Genevieve Fortier. Terror Train Podcast Opening and Closing Poems Written by Mary Genevieve Fortier Host Segment Dialogue for Terror, The Disembodied Voice Written by Mary Genevieve Fortier Production Music The House of Leaves Chase Pulse The Hive And The Voices By Kevin McLeod Incapitech.com Featured Works 
The Devil's Chariot, written by Dennis Banning. Production music, Nightbreak, Land of Phantoms, and excerpt from Red Letter by Kevin McLeod and Copatech.com. Summer Train, written by Bridget Kephart. Production music, The Path of the Goblin King, Jarvik 8, Long Note 4. And excerpt from Red Letter by Kevin McLeod in Compatech.com. Additional sound effects by AudioSoundClips.com. Podcast program edited by David Schutz II. The stories and poems presented in the Terror Train podcasts are all featured in the James Ward Kirk Publishing Anthology, Terror Train, which was edited by Krista Clark Grabowski and A. Henry Keene. Cover art by Stephen Cooney. Content copyright 2014. Terror Train, podcast episode 108, Indiana. Copyright 2014.